All right, well, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, everyone to today's uh, October 18th edition of the uh, Polyply webinar. Uh, today we have a, a double feature on uh, tart cherry genomics uh, uh, from uh, Charity Gogritz and Kathleen Rhodes, both at Michigan State University. Uh, Charity is gonna uh, go up first uh, and tell us about her work on assembling the genome of, of tart cherry. Uh, Charity is a, a fifth year PhD candidate at Michigan State uh, in the Department of Horticulture, uh, where she is in Courtney Hollander's lab, uh, studying important aspects of temperate fruit tree development using a variety of molecular, genetic, uh, and genomic approaches. Uh, her work aims to understand the mechanisms of, of flowering time differences in, in uh, sour cherry populations, uh, this is Prunus cerasus, uh, uh, which is a segmental allotetraploid, and we're gonna hear much more about that today. Uh, Charity became uh, fascinated by the genetics of this polyploid while assembling and annotating the first reference quality genome for the species. Uh, after completing her PhD, she wants to uh, become a plant breeder for temperate fruit trees or other horticultural crops in an academic setting. And when she's not dissecting flowers or staring at DNA sequences, she enjoys painting landscapes and spending time with her partner and, and, and their cats. And I think I've, I've seen some of those cats on Twitter, I believe. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, But uh, Cherry is going to uh, tell us today about uh, not so much about the cats, but about the pie cherry. So the genome assembly annotation of the pie cherry prunus cerasus. And I'm really looking forward to, to hearing about this. Yeah, we'll thank you, Mike. Away. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for the lovely introduction. Um, you might see my cats. They could make a cameo, but no promises. So again, thanks for the introduction and organizing this webinar series. I'm really glad to have this opportunity to talk with you all today about a collaboration to assemble and annotate the first sour cherry genome. So thanks for coming to my talk, which is aptly titled The Genome Assembly and Annotation of a Pie Cherry, Prunus cerasus cultivar Montmorency. First things first, I want to let you all know that I'll probably slip up and call sour cherry tart cherry as well. So sour, tart, pie, cherry, all the same thing. And sour cherry is very important to the Michigan industry here, and we currently have the only breeding program in the nation. And by far the most dominant cultivar in the US industry is this French selection known as Montmorency. I know genome talks can be kind of can be kind of dry sometimes. So I'll do my best to be entertaining, but also informative without bogging folks down with the details. So this presentation will first be an introduction to sour cherry evolution and genetics, setting Kathleen up for her talk after me and an overview of the methods we've used to complete the genome and how we validated those methods have worked well. So to open my talk today and lead you into Kathleen's, I think we need to have a chat about the proposed evolution of Prunus. The genus includes more than 200 species of deciduous and evergreen woody plants that are distributed worldwide, minus Antarctica, and it includes cultivated tree fruit superstars like peach, cherry, plum, apricot, almond, and more. The genus Prunus is monophyletic and consists of several subgroups. It's thought that the center of origin for Prunus is Eastern Asia and the center of diversity is Eurasia. The genus is thought to have diverged from the rest of the Rosaceae plant family between 56.7 and 67.4 million years ago during the early Eocene era, at a time when both the Bering Land Bridge, which is BLB in this figure on the right, and the North Atlantic Land Bridge, which is NALB on this figure to the right, likely facilitate, facilitated the distribution of the Prunus species from their center of origin. This theory was solidified by this group of researchers here, Chinadal, using biogeographical evidence and phylogenetic evidence. This figure to the right is supposed to summarize the distribution of the Coriombos lineage of Prunus, which includes sour cherry, and Coriombos is referring to the inflorescence architecture of this group of, of prunus. So a few species of significance are highlighted. I'd like to draw your attention to P. avium. That's the sweet cherry that you buy in the grocery store and eat fresh. So we'll talk more about him in a minute. And finally, here's a fun fact for you all, because ploidy is always a competition. I thought I'd let you know that ploidy levels in prunus range from diploid to about 22x. Okay, so I've hinted at the fact that the genus Prunus is rather promiscuous. Interspecies hybridizations have been known to occur. An example is our species of interest today, Prunus cerasus, which is thought to be a, a hybrid between two Prunus species, Fruticosa and Avium. Again, you've all likely encountered Avium before, fresh eating sweet cherry, and it's a diploid. Fruticosa, on the other hand, is a shrubby little tetraploid tree native to Russia and is mainly used as a rootstock. So you might think, ah, oh, wait, how do a tetraploid and a diploid come together to make another tetraploid? 
Well, the story supposedly goes like this. So Prunus avium originated near the southern end of the Black Sea, highlighted by this red circle. The red arrows delineate its general dis direction of dispersal for many Prunus species, long range dispersal is usually done by birds. Conversely, the blue circle highlights Prunus fruticosa's point of origin and somewhere in the habitat overlap of these two species, a reduced gamete from Prunus fruticosa merged with an unreduced gamete of Prunus avium to form the allotetraploid Prunus seraphis. This hybridization event is thought to have happened multiple times in both directions. In other words, there's evidence that both reciprocal uh, crosses have happened, but by far Prunus fruticosa as the egg don donor seems to be more common. So when these events happened is unclear, but human consumption of the sour cherry, the hybrid, has been documented around 5000 BC. And this hypothesis of Prunus seraphis' origin story first arose in 1968, when two researchers created hybrids between avium and fruticosa that looked strikingly similar to seraphis. And this, hypo this hypothesis is also supported by nuclear and chloroplast DNA marker evidence. So now let's talk about what the genome structure actually looks like today with the cultivars that we study. So the initial hybridization event that led to Prunus seraphis' formation sort of defines it as an allopolyploid, but during meiosis, it doesn't always act like one. When we think of a strict allopolyploid, we think disomic inheritance with no pairings between homologous chromosomes. But segregation data suggests that Prunus seraphis exhibits disomic and tetrasomic inheritance. Shown here on the left, a fluorescent micrograph taken during metaphase one of pollen meiosis demonstrates that variable meiotic pairing and abnormalities are not uncommon during Fusoracis's meiosis, where Roman numeral one, two, and four show univalent, bivalent, and tetravalent meiotic pairings. On the right here, genomic in situ hybridization experiments from 1998 showed Prunus fruticosa labeled DNA on every chromosome in three sour, sour cherry cultivars suggesting homologous exchange does in fact occur and that the cytological evidence supports the marker segregation data. Now what the genome structure actually looks like is a bit of a mystery, but stay tuned and Kathleen will talk more about that. Her ultimate goal is to de determine this genomic structure and speculate what impacts this has on certain phenotypes of agronomic interest. So to summarize my presentation so far, studying sour cherry genetics can answer interesting biological questions surrounding hybridization and polyploidy in the tree species and enhance the breeding potential for this crop. And having a high quality genome would greatly accelerate both purposes. But until very recently, such a resource didn't exist. So the Iazoni Van Buren and Hollander labs at MSU decided to collaborate and make it happen to assemble and annotate the most important cultivar here in the US, Montmorency. And to stick to our pie theme today, I'll use the analogy that a pie crust is like our assembly and the pie filling is the good stuff, which is the gene space and structural annotation of the genome assembly. So for our pie crust ingredients, we did pack bio long reading sequencing at about 100x depth, uh, genomic DNA alumina sequencing at 57x for polishing and camera analyses and high C sequencing for scaffolding. For our pie filling, or evidence used to annotate the genome, we sequenced RNA from a variety of tissues and aligned manually curated protein sequences to the genome. So of course, if the DNA and RNA evidence to assemble and annotate our genome is the ingredients, the workflow would be our recipe. So this slide is just, meant, is just meant to walk us through the overall process that we use to create the genome. So with our three DNA libraries, we created the initial assembly using CANU. We polished the assembly with our short reads to correct small errors. After that, the high C reads were aligned to the genome and the resulting matrix, which is output from juicer and 3D DNA, showed us where the assembled sequences were relative to one another in the nucleus. When we were happy with the assembly, we took our cherry filling ingredients, RNA-seq, cDNA sequencing, and protein data sets to find that gene space using Maker. After a couple of iterations of Maker, we did some manual annotation of the genes that were fused together using a new software from the child lab here at MSU called Diffusion, and also some annotation of genes we're very interested in. And so we're very uh, um, trying to make sure that the gene structures of those genes are perfect. So Kathleen will talk about some of those genes we're interested in. And finally, after some filtering steps, we had our annotated chromosome scale assembly. Now let's talk about our assembly results. So a camera analysis estimated the genome size to be about 621 megabases, which is in line with other Prunus species. 
This is a mercury kamer plot here on the right, and it indicates the multiplicity of kamers from our Illumina reads, our genomic DNA reads that map to the assembly. So in other words, the software looks at your kamers, uh, a kamers multiplicity in an Illumina data set, and then counts how many times that kamer appears in your assembly. So the red peak indicates kamers that are found at a 1x depth relative to the rest of the Illumina data set, and the lower kamer multiplicity that that red peak sits at on the plot indicates it's found one time in our assembly. So we've got four peaks or four groups of kamer multiplicities as expected from our highly heterozygous allotetraploid. The NG50 of the assembly was 11.56 megabases, which means that at least 310 megabases of the assembly or half the haplogenome size was in context of 11.56 megabases or larger. A BUSCO score showed that conserved orthologs of the Vertiplanty database were 98% complete, but of those, 94% were duplicated, because I'm sure none of us have forgotten here that we are working with an allopolyploid. As a result of the scaffolding portion of the pipeline, we had 16 clearly defined leakage groups with clear high C interactions along the links, suggesting these were eight pairs of homeologous chromosomes. This was reassuring, since the ancestral number of Prunus chromosomes is eight. In total, the scaffolded portion of the genome worked out to be about 82% of the estimated haploid genome size. Okay, so to convince you of the homeologous nature of these 16 linkage groups that came out of the 3DNA pipeline, here's the high C matrix as viewed in juice box assembly tools. The blue arrow is pointing to a thin diagonal line of red, indicating strong evidence for physical interactions between these first two linkage groups, these two first squares, all along the length of their sequences. We took these 16 chromosomes and we conducted a centenary analysis using Koji against the Prunus persica genome, which is peach. And it's a diploid and one of the best Prunus genomes we have to date. And after the centenary analysis it became clear, so here on the right is the results of that centenary analysis, it became clear that each linkage group was indeed part of a pair and highly centenic with the eight peach chromosomes. So each linkage group in a pair was given a respective number according to the peach centenary and either A or B. So this result was also very reassuring because it's a known fact that gen the genus Prunus has extremely high collinearity between genomes. So aside from the main scaffolds, we also assembled uh, sequences that formed like eight more groups and had clear physical interactions with, eight with the eight pairs of the linkage groups in the assembly. And that's what those purple arrows here in this figure are indicating. But if you look closely at these groups, you'll see the high C signals are a bit all over the place, and there are drops in signal across the lengths of these group sequences, indicating that these sequences don't necessarily belong next to each other in the nucleus. Therefore, I don't really consider these true chromosomes, but rather a collection of alternative alleles that got disjointed from the rest of the assembly. The fact that these are alternative alleles has been verified in several ways, most convincingly through syntony analyses. So traditionally, for a reference genome, these might not be of interest to many folks, but as from a breeding perspective, it is nice that we do have some alternative alleles uh, assembled that we could potentially compare with, with others. So finally, we took our scaffolded assembly and we mapped markers onto it from a genetic map of an F1 cross where Montmorency was the maternal parent. So here's a sampling of that genetic map for three of the linkage group pairs. In the middle of each pair, there's a genetic map with each horizontal line representing a genetic marker. As you can see, most markers shown here map once to each of each homeologous chromosome with a few exceptions. So one exception, can you guys see my cursor okay? Yeah, so if you look at chromosome three right here, you can see that this marker in particular only aligned to chromosome 3B. And then there are some other exceptions that deviate from perfect collinearity, where these two markers align with crisscross, indicating you know, there might be a little bit of an inversion, inversion in our assembly relative to the genetic map. But overall, we had near perfect collinearity, uh, and we got similar results for, these, for the other linkage groups as well. OK, so moving on. Since we were happy with the assembly, we went on with annotating the gene space. We used Maker for annotation and ran it twice. Our RNA-seq and nanopore cDNA evidence was aligned with STAR and Minimap, respectively. And then these transcriptome assemblies were used as evidence for Maker to train gene finders like SNAP and Augustus. We downloaded publicly available high-quality plant protein data, database or ugh, data sets from Uniprot and Arabidopsis or Tear.org and aligned them with Exonerate. 
These data sets were also given to Maker as evidence similarly to the transcriptome assemblies. And once these predictions were complete, we filtered them to only keep those with known protein domains. Then we used a new software developed by the Child's Lab to disentangle fused gene annotations on the main scaffolds called diffusion and manually annotated a handful of our favorite genes with a software called Apollo that was developed by some brilliant researchers at Berkeley. I'll spare you the details on that process, but after all was said and done, we removed the remaining predictions containing TE related domains. So I wasn't going to spend a lot of time discussing the details of manual annotation with you all, because uh, <laughs> it's kind of labor intensive, but I did want to give a plug to the diffusion software that the Child's Lab has developed. Their manuscript is close to publishing and details can be found on Jha's uh, GitHub page here. So the software identifies tandem duplicate gene models that might be fused together after annotation with Maker, but it can do a lot more with some patients. So for our genome, the gene space was very tight. Often gene UTRs would overlap or be less than 100 base pairs apart, which represents a technical, technical difficulty with, with annotation softwares. Um, because if genes are too close, it often fuses them. So here's a screenshot of a region of our genome in a genome browser with a fused gene model. It's shown in the track with the red box around it. We know the gene is fused based on the evidence. So the track right below is protein evidence. And notice how there are two different proteins aligning to two different spots of that annotation model. And the RNA-seq evidence, is, which is the bottom track here with coverage uh, information is also clearly not continuous along this predictions length either. So this dashed orange line is approximating where that gene split should be. So with diffusion, you can you can give genomic coordinates uh, to the software, and then Maker will be rerun and annotate those areas separately. So taking this improperly fused gene model in this red box and correcting it to nearly perfect intron exon structure of the two genes, as shown in the top track and designated by the green arrow. So overall, diffusion helped us diffuse roughly 2,500 gene models on our main genome scaffolds. So here's a summary of our final annotation results of the scaffolded assembly. So I'm talking about those 16 main linkage groups. The AED is a metric calculated by Maker for every gene model that's used to describe how well the predicted gene models agree with the evidence to support them. So zero is complete agreement, and one is an unsupported gene model. The AED is a metric made up of base or exon level accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity, and is calculated as so. Values less than 0.2 are considered to be pretty high quality gene models, and the graph to the right shows the cumulative distribution of AED values for our scaffolded assembly. So the green dotted line is AEDs equals 0.2, and the red line is 0.5. So well over half of our gene models show AED values that are less than 0.2 and approximately 90% show AED scores below 0.5. Here are a few more numbers for you in regards to the annotation. So approximately 49,937 protein coding genes were predicted for the scaffolded portion of the assembly, made up of an average of 3,466 base pairs or 393.5 amino acids. A BUSCO assessment of the transcript and protein sequences indicate 96 and 94.4% were complete respectively, with greater than 70% duplicated for both metrics, not unexpected for all our allopolyploid. So to summarize, a high NG50 value BUSCO completeness score and concordance with the genetic map indicate the high quality of this assembly and the shape of the AED graph, low median AED score and high BUSCO completeness of transcript and protein sequences indicates a high quality annotation as well. So now that we have this genome, well, what are we going to do with it? Well, Kathleen is going to tell you a bit about her exploration of subgenome dominance in Prunus using this genome in the next talk. These questions are fascinating from both an evolutionary and breeding program perspective because the progenitor species of sour cherry are adapted to very different climates and therefore differ in a number of agronomic traits that are of special interest to the breeding program at MSU. So identifying what regions of the genome are derived from either progenitor will help us understand how these traits are regulated and paint a better picture of the evolutionary history of sour cherry. Uh, and with that, I include my presentation and I wanna express my thanks to everyone on this slide. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. 
All right, well, thank you, Charity, for a, a great talk. Uh, as always, uh, feel free to uh, put your questions in the chat box and we'll take those. We've got a, a plenty of time for questions here. Um, and uh, if you have any questions too, we can always pop on your audio and video and ask away. I have a question. All yeah, right. Go ahead, Anna. Would AED values be useful only if you're annotating uh, the genes, or would that also be useful if you're if you're trying to do uh, uh, if you're looking for, say, SNPs in a sequence? Oh no, this is this is a very specific metric that's calculated to. Uh, it's like for the annotation process that tells you how well your evidence like RNA-seq and protein alignments agree with the model that comes out of Maker and says this is your gene. So it doesn't it, there's no, really no way that you could apply this to like SNP detection or something like that. Okay, I'm brand new to this, so I just wanted to- No, try. that's Thank fine. No, I appreciate the question. Uh, hello, can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah, okay, uh, great talk. Um, Thanks. So you said there are two progenitors of this species. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have uh, the genome assemblies of those two species as well? Right, yeah. So um, there are several assemblies for Prunus avium. The better one just came out, I think, last year in December. So that one was done with nanopore sequencing. There, we also sequenced and did a lot of the same assembly methods for a Prunus fruticosa genotype that we have uh, at the research center at MSU. Um, so, but that one's, that one's not scaffolded. It's kind of a bunch of raw contigs that have been annotated, but for our purposes, we're interested in just finding out which alleles might be derived. So that should serve our purpose. Um, but my overall answer to your question is, yes, there's a good assembly for sweet cherry, and there's sort of like this contig mess that should be suitable for our purposes for fruticosa. Okay, because I, I'm thinking that if you have the genome assembly of the progenitors, maybe you can use it to uh, improve your genome assembly, but I think that you're you're already happy with your genome assemblies, right? So. <laughs> yes, but I am still open to improvement. <laughs> so okay. if you have suggestions, I'm happy to. Uh, and I work on hybrid species. I'm just thinking because, because generally it's easier if the species is not not a hybrid, right? It, it if the species is a diploid. Yeah, yeah, and um, these diploid assembly. So Prunus avium is a diploid assembly, and they've just assembled like a haploid mesh of the different the two different alleles that have that are in the because so the cultivar that was sequenced is called Tiaton, and mm -hmm. All of the Prunus species are highly heterozygous. They're obligate outcrossers. So the assembly process kind of has to be a sacrifice of, you know, do I assemble alternative alleles or do I just collapse everything and just get like a haploid representative? So as for the uh, tetraquite species you're working on? Yeah, the, the tetraploid one is a little bit more complex. It's definitely, so the problem with Prunus fruticosa is it's not very well studied. And we don't actually know if it's an auto or an allo tetraploid. Mm -hmm. There's nothing, there, there is segregation data that's been, uh, well, <laughs> so someone at the University of Saskatchewan has been using it in a breeding program, but I don't know how well that they've been marking segregation data with like really clear markers, because that would be a, a good way to tell whether this segre segregates as an allo or an auto. Um, but I don't think that they have that data because we reached out and <laughs> the answer was more like, well, they hybridize regularly or they back cross with each other pretty regularly. So they just consider it another uh, sour cherry. <laughs> And I was like, okay, well, that's not super helpful for understanding the genetic, the genomic architecture. But um, I have a question in the chat. Oh, were you? Yeah, uh, Dong Ha's question there. Uh, uh, Dong Ha, if you want to pop on, and feel free. Or I can read your question, whichever yeah, is the best. Sec one second, sorry. <laughs> Ah uh, yeah, it's uh, just uh, yeah. I, I think this was discussed uh, from the question from earlier one too. Like uh, how describe or shortly like how to detect the ones with the alternative alleles. How can you like very clearly like take it them out uh, of the like chromosome assemblies? 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, your your question is, you know, how do you really know that those are alternative alleles, kind of? Yeah. 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 So um, partially because of the really strong physical interactions that those groups of sequences have with oh. those other linkage groups. Um, and that was what I was trying to show you with the high C matrix and the zoom up of the little dotted purple box. But also you can do syntony comparisons and you can see that there are it's like pretty strong collinearity between the different linkage groups. And you mm -hmm. can also look at um, orthologous genes groupings too. And I've also checked, um, so with my RNA-seq evidence, a lot of it tends to multi-map, of course. Um, and I can look at a read that has multi-map and one of them, or one mapping will be on chromosome 1A. And then the other mapping might be on alt one is what I'm calling these other groups. So it's very evident with the RNA seq evidence too that it aligns here, but it also could align over here too. More suggestion yeah. that it's uh, that's alternative. Yeah. So like uh, to call them from uh, like a real duplicates, uh, like uh, uh, when you compare them, do they have something like a KS values like really, really low, like uh, almost zero? We could do KS comparisons between the different alleles. That's a good idea, just as another like form of, of yeah. um, evidence. That's a great idea. No, we have That is what, what I usually see That's... when there is an alternative okay. uh, yeah, alleles. Then, uh, so I, I was wondering whether like- uh, No, that's without, a great suggestion. Yeah, without rely, relying on the like high seek yet, <laughs> because yeah. sometimes you don't have, have that kind of uh, yeah, right. data. Right. But thank yeah, you that's... for clarifying. Thank you. Yeah, that, that, that's also my experience. Strong without high C, the low KS yeah. also works for trying to figure out. Although you never quite know uh, if it's depending on what data you have. But but anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, I have a I have a real quick question before we run out. Too. I, I found this the whole sort of origins of the of, of, of Sarasa to be the, of, of sour cherry to be very fascinating. So mm -hmm. is I mean, do you, do you think that you'll be able to sort out maybe Kathleen will talk about this sort of the, I mean, it seems uh, fascinating that you can have this this reduced this reduced gamete from the foreign met and unreduced from the the two in mm -hmm. species and uh, and hybridized and maybe multiple times. Uh, is there what are the I mean, what is the history for Dakota then? I mean, is it an auto and it, I gather and do its we parents exist? No one knows. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I really wish we did, but yeah, it's awesome. I, I anyway. Mean, there's a cool, there's a wonderful story there. I mean, for someone yeah, to, yeah. to really we're, we're tackle. We're super excited. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I mean, I kick myself every day thinking like, why the hell don't we know? <laughs> this is not <laughs> our now. Well, I, I have to think back. I used to work on elms uh, and American elms and their tetraploids. And that's how I got one of the ways that, how I really got into polyploidy. And for years, we didn't, we had no idea where there was any diploid. We didn't know the progenitor is the same kind of thing. It had a different chloroplasts clearly than all the other elms that, that, that were available but uh, that we had sampled but uh years later it turned out that someone found a well well not not too long ago actually just a few years ago they found a diploid american elm populations down in southern alabama and so you get these sort of uh refugia that, that the tetraploids then looks like they expanded back out uh, after the last glacial maximum but um mm. I'm always curious, you know, are there, you know, diploid fruticosa then hanging out somewhere that are just, you know, None one little pop? Found. Yeah, nothing yeah. you guys know about. Yeah. I just, I, anyway, I just find this fascinating. So it's yeah. a, no, it's really, it's really interesting. It's what also kind of is a problem too is that this hybridization has occurred multiple times and then there is BRAC crossing that happens with Prunus right. So it's almost like it contaminates the Prunus fruticosa gene pool a little bit. And so there is a one paper that, that, looks at that a little bit because they do form a hybrid with that back cross. So even, I mean, from what I've heard from Amy, who's actually gone out to <laughs> Siberia for some of these sample collections for these genotypes, it's it's really hard sometimes to right, tell right. the difference between what's true and what's not. And my other question related to that, and then I'll, then I'll, I'll let you go, <laughs> is, uh, I think that's it. Um, oh, not literally Siberia, but yes, okay, uh, Russia. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> but uh, how, how old uh, do you, is this all sort of the last few thousand years, or how, how old do you think the, the, the polyplotization event uh, I mean, was? I mean, it's not a, You don't know. <laughs> I will say 
it's we love be, getting this question because we don't know. It's, it's got to be it's got to be more than a few thousand because, like I said, there is some like cherry pit like Bronze Age evidence of right. this hybrid, um, like five thousand BC. So humans were kind of you know it was the hybrid we're was clearly, making their fancy yeah right around right around five thousand BC. So you know it got to, it had to happen a little bit before that, but at least yeah for wow. a lot at least very cool. Very cool. Well, I'll, I'll, I look forward to hearing much more about this. I think once you, once you get these genomes and, and, and uh, start doing some more analyses, it'll be mm -hmm. uh, really, uh, a lot of the stuff will hopefully become, uh, uh, come out of that. So great. <laughs> well, All, <we're> right. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, well, let's uh, thank Charity for a wonderful talk. And we'll go to part two now of uh, our, our Sour Cherry double feature um, from Kathleen Rhodes. Uh, Kathleen is a fourth year PhD student in the plant breeding genetics and, and biotechnology program at Michigan State University, uh, where she works in the lab of Dr. Uh, Amy Lazzoni, uh, the nation's only sour cherry breeder. Uh, her dissertation work is on the evolution of uh, subgenome dynamics in sour cherry and how these subgenomes may be affecting fruit growth and development. Uh, after finishing her PhD, she plans to continue working in plant breeding of, of horticultural crops. And when she's not agonizing over sour cherry genetics, she enjoys the moderately dangerous hobbies of keeping bees and playing roller derby. Um, and with that, I'd like to welcome uh, Kathleen to today's, uh, uh, to finish up here, our second half of our double feature. All right, take it away, Kathleen. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mike, for having us and for putting this on. Um, yeah, I'm gonna be, Charity provided a really wonderful introduction so that I don't have to do all of the introducing I usually do <laughs> for uh, assigning subgenomes in allotetraploid sour cherry, which is the first part of my dissertation work. Come on, cooperate with me. Okay, so what are my objectives here? Uh, primarily, well, first of all, uh, assigning subgenomes in Sour cherry Montmorency in order to determine relative dosages of each progenitor subgenome. As we all know, in polyploidy webinar, all polyploids do not always have balanced dosages. Uh, I would also like to identify which chromosomes and which regions are derived from each progenitor. Uh, they're very, as, as Charity alluded to, they're very phenotypically different trees adapted to very different climates. Uh, so how is that being passed on and expressed in sour cherry? Um, uh, on, a, on a more zoomed in level, I want to identify progenitors for candidate genes for bloom and fruit development traits and compare that with the decades of phenotype data we have here in the sour cherry, sour cherry breeding program at MSU. Uh, and in the future, move on to assigning subgenomes in diverse genotypes of sour cherry because we have this plentiful phenotypic diversity and, and climate adaptation diversity in sour cherry. And right now we hypothesize based on the diverse phenotypes that subgenome dosage may in fact differ between exceptions. Okay, so let's talk about our approach. Um, as we almost started talking about during the Q&A for charities uh, talk, I uh, am looking at rates of synonymous mutations, so chaos between two orthologs, uh, in order to assign uh, progenitors for P. Uh, keeping in mind here, because I know this helps me remember, uh, lower chaos means uh, an ortholog is probably more closely derived from that respective uh, progenitor species. So we're starting with our shiny new Montmorency genome, which I'm sure you're all convinced is wonderful, and I certainly like working with it. Um, we also have, as we talked about during the Q&A, a Prunus fruticosa draft and annotation which is in context, it's not in like formal chromosomes, um, but it's very, very well annotated using the same pipeline we use for Montmorency, and that was good enough for me. Um, and then thirdly, using, as Charity mentioned again, uh, the Titan version 2.0 Prunus avium genome, which is the first sour cherry genome, at least that I'm aware of, that uh, use long range sequencing for creating sour cherries or, or sweet cherries. Uh, own chromosome scaffolds, all previous sweet cherry uh, reference genomes had been short reads aligned to each, which is a bother. Um, so then we've used MC scan in the JCVI uh, environment to find a list of orthologs. And then I use this wonderful, wonderful pipeline uh, 
made by Alan Yaka of Pat Edgers Lab at MSU. I think Alan's on the call, probably because he expected me to shout him out. Uh, <laughs> and that uses muscle and PAML to assign KA and KS rates. Um, so the important thing to keep in mind here is that this pipeline takes two species at a time. So I'm starting with a data set comparing sweet cherry to sour cherry and a data set comparing spinach fruticosa to sour cherry. Um, so let's talk about data curation. Uh, as I just said, I am starting with a sour cherry and sweet cherry comparison, um, a set of orthologs with K and KS values assigned, and a separate but similar data set uh, comparing with our Prunus fruticosa graph genome. And through the magic of tidyverse in R, I can come up with three separate data sets uh, from those two. So in purple, we have almost 23,000 common orthologs identified in both data sets. In red, we have almost 36,000 orthologs only found in comparison with Prunus avium. And then in blue, we have 31,000 orthologs only found in comparison with Prunus fruticosa. Uh, so obviously that purple box is really interesting. Um, what we do first is filter out all ortholog pairs with a KS greater than 2.0 based on the literature and my understanding. Uh, anything the KS greater than 2.0 is kind of just meaningless data noise, so we don't need to bother with that. Um, and then for the common orthologs identified in birth progenitors, I assigned a value I called delta KS, which for each Prunus cerasus ortholog, it's the difference between the KS relative to the avium progenitor and the KS relative to the, to the fruticosa progenitor. Um, and from there, I keep only the prunus cerasus orthologs with a delta KS greater than one standard deviation uh, away from the mean for sub subgenome assignments, because um, I guess it's just the plant breeder in me. But since we're, <laughs> since we're really thinking of the world, real world applications of these subgenome assignments, we want to be as confident in them as possible, because that translates into trees planted and dollars spent and all that good stuff. Um, so then from those two sets, I have genes, or from that one set, I have my genes assigned to Prunus avium and genes assigned to Prunus fruticosa based on the delta KS values. And then going back to what I call the uniques files, um, for these orthologs only identified one progenitor, I filter out um, ortholog pairs above the 75th percentile of KS values. So once again, just wanting to be really confident about what I'm assigning here. So then I have a nice filtered list of orthologs only found in one progenitor. And I combine these all together to come up with just about 27,000 total genes assigned to Prunus avium and a little over 16,000 genes assigned to Prunus fruticosa. Um, and this is about 45% of the total uh, number of genes uh, annotated in the genome. And I may ask, I'm going to ask you questions about this later because I want to know what the smartest webinar in polyability has to say about it. But uh, looking at KS values for our respective sets is a sanity check to make sure uh, it, <laughs> it seems to make sense. Um, for the uh, genes assigned to Prunus avium, we are seeing a lower KS relative to Prunus avium than we are for genes assigned to Prunus fruticosa. And uh, I really like my fruticosa gene set because that's very, very different, as they say in statistics. Um, and we have this, this very nice separation uh, and a very little variance uh, in the Prunus fruticosa uh, or in the KS relative to Prunus fruticosa for the genes that I assigned to Prunus fruticosa. So even though there's fewer of them, I feel really good about this guy. Oh, yes, okay. So what does this mean on a whole genome level? I think I had more of a wind up to this, but I forgot to say it. So uh, mapping these nicely assigned genes across the genome, hoping to find some big homologs or some big uh, chromosome arms or something like that. Uh, to this uh, graph on the right, yeah, is uh, all 16 main contigs. And then I blew up chromosome 1A here to explain at least what I'm graphing here. The black line is 
uh, the proportion of genes assigned per uh, percentage of genes assigned per 20 base or per 20 gene window. Uh, and then uh, the orange and blue are denoting the proportion of genes assigned to each progenitor. So for the very end of chromosome eight here, you see a little over 90% of those genes are assigned in that 20 gene window. And something like 60% of them are assigned to Prunus avium, and 60% of them are, uh, or not 60, 40% of them are assigned to Prunus verticosa. And the main takeaway here is that we have no big fun takeaways here. We were really hoping that we would see some nice, beautiful, like evidence of crossovers and like evidence of, of big home, you know, some, some big, nice homeologous uh, regions. And this is what we got. So uh, a nice lesson for me as a grad student that science doesn't always do what you want it to do. So it's very easy to look at that big genome graph and say, so what um, with the subgenome assignments? Uh, so part of what we're doing, uh, again, because I work for a plant breeder and intend to be a plant breeder, is use these subgenome assignments to look at candidate genes for uh, traits we care about and see if we can learn more about how they present in sour cherry. The bloom time is a really, really good example of this um, because the Prunus fruticosa progenitor up in Russia with the long winters blooms very, very late. It's usually the last thing to bloom in our orchard. The Prunus avium uh, progenitor from more Southern Europe blooms very early. It's usually among the earliest uh, bloomers in our orchard. And since we've got them all in the same orchard, undergoing the same weather conditions every year, we can tell you there is a lot of genetic control of bloom time. Uh, and this picture on the right is actually showing two full sib sour cherries in a population segregating for bloom time. And uh, this individual on the left here, circled in red, is more Prunus avium-like. It's already past full bloom. And this individual on the right, uh, circled in blue, to be more, it's more Prunus fruticosa-like. It's just entering, just getting into full bloom. We consider, um, we, we call it bloom when 50% of the flowers are open. So it's probably just shy of that based on looking at that one branch. Um, so these two, despite being full siblings, bloom like a week apart, which is bananas long time, especially when you're talking about being a Michigan cherry grower who might get uh, your whole crop ruined by one frost in the you know last week of April. Seven days is a big, big difference. Da, da, da. Let's see. So uh, one of the really well characterized genes for bloom control in Prunus is dormancy associated Madfox genes or DAM genes. And then get over to this. Um, so DAM genes are again very well characterized in Prunus. They have to do with heat and chilling accumulation. Um, in, in Prunus, you need, especially with uh, sour cherry and sweet cherry, you need to get a certain number of chilling hours in order to release uh, endodormancy and go into ecodormancy where you start accumulating heat hours. Um, so this uh, Prunus avium section of, a, of chromosome one showing the six dam genes, which were all very, very nicely um, annotated in a paper that came out earlier this year from the Spanish group. Um, shows what you typically see in most Prunus dam papers is one, two in a space, three, four, five, six. They're on chromosome one generally. Um, peach is where this all started. Um, you can see the issue Charity talked about with uh, tandem genes being duplicated together. This is the NCBI uh, listing for um, peach dams and two, three, and four are all fused together, which we also had in our um, that was also an issue in the in the sweet cherry genome, and it's it was also something that we had to deal with in our in our tart cherry genome. Um, but this box is showing the very large deletion in the ever growing mutant of peach, um, and which even though the box is only dams one through four, there's no expression of dams one through six, nothing at all, and uh, that results in a tree that never ever goes into dormancy. It's always, it never sets terminal bud. It will keep growing new shoots until they freeze to death, uh, which is how dams were first characterized in Prunus. 
So let's look at them in sour cherry and try to contextualize. Um, we found these really nice uh, dams right where kind of where we expected to see them on chromosome one. Um, as I said, we did have to defuse their charity. Sorry, it was not not we. It was charity. Um, charity defused uh, them using the defusion and Apollo software. Um, so these are characteristic MIKC type Madsbox transcription factors, just like we expect to see same number of exons as other dams, um, same you know protein domains and all that good stuff. Um, we see the characteristic uh, gap between two and three, which just always happens for reasons that someone smarter than me will figure out someday. Uh, and zooming in with the subgenome assignments, once again, fruticosa is in blue and avium assigned, uh, avium derived genes are in red um, or orange. We were debating that. Um, you see, there's not really a clear homeologous region. Um, you know, 1A and 1B both have uh, DAM1 derived from fruticosa, so so much for hoping that one of them might have a fruticosa allele and one of them might have an avium allele. You weren't going to get that lucky. Um, so we're looking to further contextualize these DAMs and, and further, you know, provide more support that they are what we think they are and uh, contextualize these subgenome assignments, hopefully. These phylogenies. Um, so this was just made with uh, muscle and XML using a bootstrapping method and yeah, pretty standard. And we see what we generally see in other Prunus dam papers, which is um, four and six tend to be close together, one and two and three tend to be close together. Uh, this tree includes uh, Prunus cerasis or so sour cherry dams. These pea fruit are fruticosa dams that Cherry very kindly also assembled and defused for me. So I could use that. So I could use them. Um, and then the Regina is our Prunus avium sweet cherry dams. And um, interestingly, OK, so the first takeaway is this is what we expected to see, which is good. <laughs> they seem to be real dams. Adding back in the subgenome assignments, um, interestingly, all of the Prunus cerasis dams are closest on this tree to a Prunus fruticosa dam and closer than they are necessarily to an avium dam. But five of the seven that I have assigned are supposedly derived from Prunus avium. So this is interesting to chew on. Um, and this is something I am going to continue doing with other genes in the as we you know continue this analysis to further figure out what we think about these subgenome assignments and how good we feel about them. Um, but we are very happy with our DAM annotations and look forward to using those for studying bloom time and sour cherry in the future. So next steps, uh, like I said, continuing with phylogeny, um, doing phylogeny based on the whole genome, is that going to show that Prunus cerasis is more closely derived from Prunus avium, since there were more genes derived from Prunus avium, or is it going to show us something entirely different? Um, continuing with candidate gene phylogenies to complement our individual candidate gene assignments. Um, we have a lot of really nice PTLs and candidate genes in sour cherry for uh, a lot of bloom and, and fruit uh, development traits uh, that I'm looking forward to, to digging into. Uh, and assigning subgenomes and other sour cherry genotypes, like I mentioned. These red stars on this map of Europe are showing just a, a subset of all the um, sour cherry genotypes that I have sequenced at my disposal for, <laughs> for analysis. Uh, so we have Tamaris, which is one of our latest, latest bloomers, which is from up here in Russia. And way down in the south, we have Oblachinska, which is a Serbian land race. Um, and that tends to bloom on the earlier side. And then kind of in the middle, we have Schattenmorell, which is a, a German land race. And we've got a couple of really nice uh, accessions from Hungary, uh, including the Balaton cherries, which some of you might've heard of because they're getting big in the US and Erdizipli and this is my personal favorite. So looking at subgenomes and other sour cherry genotypes to see if how, the, how, how things shake out 
um, and how that might be affiliated with phenotype. And then moving on to the, uh, the uh, you know, the, the logical next step of uh, looking at gene expression bias in sour cherry uh, to see what might be going on there. So what's going on, <laughs> basically? Uh, maybe on the, on the genome wide level, Kernis genomes are similar enough that it's hard to differentiate subgenomes in an owl polyploid. I'm sure I'm not the first person to have that. Uh, there's got to be lots and lots of pro crossovers between homologs, which is consistent with our meiotic pairing observations. Uh, I'll bring to your attention once again this figure from Dei Chen Wang's uh, dissertation work in the 90s, where he found that Kernis fruticosa DNA probe hybridized with every single chromosome of sour cherry. Uh, so we, I wasn't aware of this and Charity wasn't aware of this and we were agonizing over my results. And then Amy, uh, my advisor, Amy Izoni dug out this dissertation that she suddenly remembered from a long time ago and said, oh, this matches up with, <laughs> with what you're finding. So that was sort of reassuring and sort of not because the results are real, but that means we have to really deal with them. Uh, so questions for the crowd. Do a lot of allopolyploids look like a big old patchwork quilt? And I'm just the first person to make a high resolution graph of it and be dumb enough to show it to other people. And if you are reviewing a paper talking about subgenome assignments in sour cherry, what else do you want to see in this analysis? How else can I con con convince you? How I was just agonizing with charity about an hour ago over my um, data curation methods and subgenome assignments, you know, wanting to be really confident in my subgenome assignments, but does it even matter? And how, how strict do I need to be? And, and what, what are we even doing with this? So I would love to hear from the crowd. And I will just quickly say thank you to my advisor and my committee and to Charity and Alan. And we have a really wonderful department at MSU that I'm very fortunate to, to be a part of. So. Yeah, thanks for your time. All right. Well, thank you for a great talk, Kathleen. I I, um, I really enjoyed that, and I hope you don't uh, fall into the uh, if, you, if you'll uh, excuse a bad pun the the cherry pit of despair about this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, I I think it I think it sounds great. Uh, well, we have a lot of questions, um, and I have some different thoughts and ideas too about uh, analyses and. Uh, We've got plenty of time to chat here. So, uh, our first question is um, uh, from uh, Kevin Bird. Kevin, if you want to pop on, uh, feel free to jump on and ask. Oh. Kevin. It sounded a little rough there. Maybe maybe we could just read your uh, question, huh? <laughs> uh, this is this better? Oh, that's better. Yep. That's better. Yeah, my my microphone was maxed out for some reason. I have no idea why. <clears throat> um, yeah, has has Pat told you to try his uh, the FIDES method we used for strawberry? Um, just doing single copy ortholog gene trees and finding the nearest uh, progenitor neighbor to the polyploid copies. Yeah, that's what we were talking about last week, actually, and that's why I started playing with all these phylogenies uh, to get uh, to today for today's talk is to get more into that side of of assignments and give better context to what we're doing here. Yeah, I think that should, it's, it's always nice when you have a good neopolyploid and progenitors. And then have you tried, is there whole genome resequencing for the progenitors? Do you like a read mapping approach for HEs? Yeah, <laughs> I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not as bad as it sounds. You should look at the, the B Napis uh, paper uh, and yeah. the pipeline they use for HE identification because it's, it's pretty solid. Yeah, goodness knows half of my ideas come from me. Nice. I, I would, I would second. Them. Yeah, I would second those two comments and uh, employing something like the Phi DS type approach, uh, where you can, uh, you know, add help, help the have the gene trees help inform that that identification will, might make it a little bit easier. I do think yeah. that it could be difficult if these aren't very divergent to begin with, which was my other thought as you're talking about this, and, and then you, you pointed it out. Um, but and, and it, yeah, anyway. Uh, 
it, it, you should still be able to get some resolution there because the chaos of those copies in the plots that you're showing in the earlier was were quite distinct. So there should mm -hmm. be enough divergence there. I, I think you would be able to pull those apart. So that's what I'm hoping. And, and yeah, it's an absolutely great uh, point uh, as well. Yeah. Um, all right, uh, Adam, a uh, question here. Have you tried assigning subgenomes through either gene retention or differential transposon activity? Uh, Adam, feel free to pop on if you want to. All right. Mm -hmm. That's just my question. So. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so kind of the struggle with trees uh, is <laughs> Montmorency is like a 600-ish year old uh, cultivar land race. And it's got a French name, but it's probably not from France. It was probably just brought to France. Uh, and just the, the, the fun thing slash challenging thing about doing a PhD in tree fruit is that a lot of, like since the generation time is so long, um, obviously there's only so much I can do. So I'm working, fortunately I have a really smart advisor who made a lot of really smart crosses when I was in like kindergarten. And uh, <laughs> so I don't, I have some stuff I'm working on that you will hear about in another year or two where I hope to be able to look at gene retention. Um, transposons are definitely a really interesting thing. Um, especially I just went to Pat student Beth Alger's uh, dissertation defense last week and she talks all about transposons and how they factor into allopolyploidy. So that's definitely in my head. Um, but with Montmorency, we don't know who the parents are. It was just cooked up by some like Eastern European peasant people. <laughs> um, right, but I guess, uh, I mean, these signals are gonna be things that are intrinsic to the polyploid and don't require comparison to the diploid progenitors. And so one of the things that I worry about in terms of relying on the comparison to diploid progenitors is if the progenitor species are so close that you have incomplete lineage sorting going on, you're yeah. going to just have the kind of assignments to subgenomes that you have, even if you actually have two completely distinct subgenomes that are not actually experiencing crossover events. Uh, and so that's why you would want to, there'd be an advantage to having a signal that's intrinsic to the polyploid, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Gonna keep digging further into that. All right, well, then there's a series of comments uh, from folks here in the chat box. Uh, Camille uh, recommends using Kamers and puts a link to his tool um, for uh, uh, subgenome, oh, yeah. uh, separating subgenomes by uh, using uh, Cambers, as well as a few different other suggestions for TEs. I let Camille pop on there. I saw him pop his video on. <laughs> Camille, where has this been all my life? <laughs> this looks great. That's citing my papers. I'm happy to see that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there's a video, Camille. I think you talked a little about this in the very first polyhood webinar, actually, right? So. Yeah. Well, yeah so. Uh... I do like exactly the opposite approach for assigning everything. So instead of uh, trying to understand genes, I'm always doing everything on nucleotide level and decomposing it to gamers and finding a way how to find a perfect matches of diagnostic gamers. And uh, like, like two weeks ago, we were running, I actually never did allopolyploid, but two weeks ago, we were running a workshop on, on, a, on like a gamer methods in, in uh, genomics. And uh, we had uh, Jose Serka who did this, uh, tutorial on assigning subgenomes on uh, using a camera approach. But I he, basically, in his case, he had like a palms that still had completely retained subgenomes. So I'm suspecting that it, will be, it was a lot easier to uh, like sort of assign the whole group. But uh, I think it would be really interesting to um, get away from genes and also on the nucleotide level, just because you could see the individual breakpoints rather than like yeah. knowing that like this is a region. But it would be really interesting to understand or, or like to see of how much admixture be between the two uh, subgenomes have happened and like how often, for example, drift have um, uh, caused a loss of one or the other allele. Like uh, I actually have never seen anything like this before. So uh, that that is a really exciting system. Thank you. And I'm excited to try this out. I'm definitely down for the nucleotide approach as well. 
and it was sort of what I I had started floundering around with this spring, and then talked to Pat Adger, and he was like, "Do KS," and all of Pat's students were like, "Pat told you to do KS, right?" So <laughs> that's how we've gotten this far. But yeah, this looks great. Great. We also have a, uh, a Slack for gamers. So if you would like to get uh, some support, you can just mail me and I will get you an invite link. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Yeah, I, I, I personally, I kind of go both ways. I, I find these these TE based approaches and the camera based approaches to be really, really informative. And I'm, but also as someone who's done tons of chaos stuff, I, it works really well if the things are divergent enough. That's the, if you have the power, even if you have, um, especially to sort out these sort of crude sort of scale like you know subgenome assignment across the the, the the chromosomes like that just to try to assign homologs um uh, but uh i remember seeing some of the early like chocolate genome assemblies too because they're trees like you could see the the giant blocks like there's basically no homeologs exchanges happening either right so i i feel like you've probably got given the divergence you probably have a bunch of just as you showed already likely homeologous exchanges going on that may be mixing things up, which is an interesting place in the parameter space of genome organization to be. It might be super tough to sort some of this out, but I think um, I think that combining these approaches, personally, I think it would be really cool. And as a reviewer, so thinking from that perspective, as you asked earlier, I think it would be, if you, if you did all of that, I don't think anyone would fault you for uh, <laughs> the biology being difficult, right? I think that's yeah. at the end of the day. Um, uh, and it is what it is too, right? I think, you know, some of these things uh, are going to be mixed up and you get, get where you can, because it does seem like you've got really good assemblies and, and I don't, it doesn't seem, seem like this is necessarily artifacts of that process, so. Um, yeah, yeah. that was definitely something we wanted to be sure of. Yeah. All right, well, I, I have to go to a faculty meeting. Um, my folks are still here, people want to keep talking. Um, I just want to say, uh, before, before I check out, um, uh, and I'll stop the recording here, but I do want to say that thank you to both Charity and Kathleen um, for giving two really great thought-provoking talks. I want the, the, the chat continue and the discussion uh, after I have to leave. But I, before I go, though, I want to just say that next uh, our next Polyhood webinar will be on November 15th, um, featuring uh, somewhat a Brassica double feature featuring Michael McKibben talking about applying machine learning to classify the origins of gene duplications, uh, and Annalise Mason on hybrid speciation in Brassica. Uh, and I have to get going, but I, everyone else can stick around here and chat uh, after I leave while I see Michael's on here to host uh, the meeting when I go. So uh, again, thank you, Kathleen and Charity and everybody else for showing up. And I'll, we'll see everyone in a few weeks again. Thanks, Mike.